بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى in the Quran he says that ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا from amongst his signs he created from amongst you he created mates لتسكنوا إليها in order that you might find sakina or tranquility in that relationship between a male and a female. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he put amongst you mawadda, which is a specific type of love in the Arabic language. The Arabs have many words for love. There's over ten types of love that the linguists identified in the Arabic language. But mawadda is a specific type of love. It's al-wadud is one of the names of God. It's a love that is not conditioned. It's an unconditional type of love that somebody shows to another person. The Prophet ﷺ said, تَزَوَّجَ الْوَلُودِ الْوَدُودِ Marry fertile, loving uh, mates. Fertile, loving mates. الْوَدُودِ So, mawadda is, is different from ishq, which is erotic love. It's different from mahabba even. Mawadda is a wood, is something that God promises to put amongst the believers is wood. It's a very specific type of love. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He created mates in order that you find tranquility and in order that you also uh, sh express this muwadda and this rahma, mercy. And then He says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ In this are signs for people who reflect deeply. يَتَفَكَّرُونَ the, in, in the Arabic language, tafa'ul in Arabic means to struggle with something. Tafa'ul in Arabic, yatakallaf, yatahammal, yatasabbar. It's where you struggle with something. When, you, when an Arab says tahammala, it means he, he bore it, but with difficulty. So when it says, inna fi dharika la ayatin li qawmin yatafakkaroon, it's for people who think deeply, who ponder who ponder the meanings of things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse that He created amongst us pairs. And He did that in order that we get this tranquility. Now in Arabic, the word for home or the domicile is maskan. That's one of the words. The Arabs say bayt, bata yabitu, bayatan, it means to spend the night. So the bayt is the place you spend the night. Dar, from Dara, Taduru, it's a place where you are moving about. It's the place where you do your things. But Maskan is a very specific type of word in Arabic. Because the, the Quran says, Masakinu tardawnaha. You have houses that you enjoy, that you're pleased with. There's rida, there's contentment. So Maskan, in the Arabic language, is called Ism Makan. It's the place of Sakina. It's the place that you find Sakana. Sakana is the opposite of Haraka. It's a stillness. It's a place you find stillness or tranquility. So the, the domicile in the Arabic language is the place for Sakina. It's the place you're meant to find tranquility. Now one of the major problems that human beings suffer from is violence. This is a human problem. You find it in every part of the world. You even find it in the animal kingdom. Biologists and people that study animals, zoologists, used to think that wars were specific to humans. That animals didn't really have wars. They fought. They were violent, but they didn't have wars. But then they discovered that there are actually animals out there, species, of biological life that have wars. Ants. There are types of ants that have wars. They take slaves. So war is part of 
the natural order of things, violence. Now, civilization attempts to regulate violence. That's why you have laws, you even have international laws, international laws of the, the, the Muslims called it seer. In fact, in, in a book called The History of Bombing, which is a history of using aerial warfare, the, scho the scholar that wrote that book said the first person to actually put down a system of international laws in, in regarding warfare between nations was Abu Hanifa, a Nu'man, a, a, a non-Muslim scholar who said the first person to regulate or to attempt to regulate warfare was Abu Hanifa anhu. But we know it was the Prophet وسلم, because that's where Abu Hanifa got his ideas from. So civilization attempts to regulate violence because it knows that humans are going to become violent but you have to do something with the violence so how do you regulate violence so there are laws you have coercive laws every government uses violence a policeman carries a gun why because he's ready to use it to prevent harm so violence is used to prevent harm in a civilized environment in an uncivilized or barbaric environment it's used to inflict harm and this is the difference between the civilized and the uncivilized. The civilized will resort to violence to prevent harm or to stop harm, and the barbaric will resort to violence as a means of achieving their ends. Now, when you have a domestic situation, the purpose that human beings come together cannot be reduced to one purpose. There's nothing that says, for instance, that the purpose of marriage is procreation. Even though you'll find that, I think it's a misguided statement in, in books on Islam, because that is not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is actually tahsin al-farj. It's to protect yourself by finding a tranquility in another person so that you don't become bestial. So it's actually a civilizing force. Marriage is part of the civilizing process. It's the way people become more human. It civilizes human beings when they enter into a marital contract. And that's why when children are brought into the world, both partners accept responsibility for those children. Now, generally, the male accepts the responsibility of maintenance. And this is why in the Quran it says, Rijal qawwamun al nisa Men are maintainers of women. Ibn Ashur, the great Muslim scholar from Tunisia, probably, I think, the most significant scholar of the 20th century, but that's obviously debatable. Ibn Ashur, in his tafsir, says that this verse does not mean that all men take care of all women, but this is the norm. And the Quran speaks to people based on norms. There are women who take care of men, and we witness that every day. There are men who get sick and wives who will work to support their husbands. For whatever reasons, you have deadbeat dads. You have husbands that don't work, and the woman goes out and works. A woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to the Prophet, what do you say about a woman who supports her husband? He said she has two rewards, the reward of maintenance and then the reward of charity because it's not an obligation for her. So even at the time of the Prophet wasalam, there were women who supported their husbands. We also know that Khadija was an independent merchant. The Prophet's wife was an independent merchant. We know that about her. She actually supported the Prophet wasalam, even though he earned his livelihood, he worked for her, but she was the one who was hiring him. So you have these situations. Now, in a domestic environment, the purpose of a domestic environment is in order for the human project to come to fruition. Now, there are many dimensions to the human project, but the single and primary dimension is the spiritual dimension according to our belief. So part of the reason for marriage is that you take a partner in order for the two of you to work towards that goal of becoming pleasing to your Lord. And that's why there are many hadiths that Allah loves 
marriage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves people coming together. Allah loves that families are built. Allah loves to see a man exhausted at the end of the day who's earning livelihood to support his family. The Prophet said that the real jihad is supporting your family. He said, Man ala waliduhu, the one who supports his, his parent, or waladuhu, or his uh, ch child, that that is a jihad, struggling in the way of Allah. Now, that is the primary purpose. And then there's also the companionship that you need, ishra, what the Arabs call ishra. Wa bil ma'ruf. Live with them in the best way, with the women that you take as mates. Live with them with ma'ruf, with what's good, what's known. And then there's also children, which is one of the great blessings of coming together, family. It extends. You have grandchildren, hafada. The Arabs call the grandfather jed and jedda, grandmother, meaning wealthy. Dul jed, also you jedded. It renews their lineage. So what happens then when things go wrong? What happens when things go wrong in a family? There are times when the family goes wrong. Allah says in the Quran that he created you in pairs in order that you might live together harmoniously. <laughs> but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says things can go wrong. Because he says in Imra'atun خَافَتْ مِنْ بَعْدِهَا نُشُوزَ أَوْ إِعْرَابَ فَلَا جُنَحَا عَلَيْهِمَا أَنْ يُصْلِحَا that, that if a woman fears some type of harm from her husband or neglect, i'rada, neglect, then there's no sin on them to try to work out some amicable situation. And Allah says, well, sulhu khair. To work things out, to come to some type of resolution is a good thing. But greed, avarice, covetousness is part of human nature. So there's a warning in there. But if you have ihsan, and if you have taqwa, if you are pious of God, God knows what you're doing and will reward you. So right there in the verse, it tells you that it's good to come to some amicable agreement. But beware of your own human nature. Doesn't he know the one who created and this is why in, in marriage relations, when one wants to get out of the marriage, often suddenly somebody gets covetous. He doesn't want anybody to have that person that he had. He thinks it's a possession of his. This is what happens. This is what the Quran is warning us about. And Allah says later in that same section, He says, And if they should separate, God will enrich each one of them from his bounty. That sometimes it's necessary to divorce. Let not a believing man despise a believing woman. If he dislikes one quality, he should love other qualities. In other words, focus on the positive. But sometimes you have to separate. You have to go your separate ways. Because not everybody is compatible. Not everybody has sakina. Not everybody has mawadda, has this unconditional love. Not everybody has mercy. This is part of, of human nature. But the one thing that God does not allow is oppression. Ya ibadi, inni ja'altu haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadhalamu. Oh, my servant. I have prohibited oppression upon myself. Out of his bounty, God can do whatever he pleases. I have prohibited oppression from my own self, and I have made it prohibited amongst you, so do not oppress one another. How many pharaohs are there? And how many Asiyas are there? Asiya is the wife of Pharaoh, living in a domestic violent situation. Pharaoh is a tyrant. He thinks he's God. There's men who think they're God, like uh, Majazi Khoda. You know, in, in Urdu, Majazi Khoda, it means like Majazi is, is, is Majaz in Arabic, is like metaphorical. Khoda is God. The husband becomes like a God. Where is that? That's not Islam. 
What is that? That's not Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. It's jahiliya. It's patriarchal jahiliya. It's from a previous generation that still has uh, to remove itself from humanity. So this is a major problem that we have on the globe, domestic violence. Now, unfortunately, if a Christian beats his wife up, it's not Christian violence. If a Jew beats his wife up, and from what the statistics show, that doesn't happen very often. But if they do, it's not Jewish violence. If a Hindu beats his wife up, it's not Hindu violence. But if a Muslim should do something to his wife, suddenly it has something to do with the religion of Islam. It has something to do with the religion of Islam. Those Muslims. What's wrong with that religion? It teaches people to be violent. Even the Quran, look at the Quran. It encourages domestic violence. And then they pull out the verse. First of all, before you can even understand the Quran, you have to give 20 years of your life to study. 20 years of your life to study. I'm, I'm not making this up. You read the conditions of tafsir. There are 12 knowledges that you have to master before you can comment on the Quran. That's the first thing. So people pick out verses, even translations. There's translations in the Quran, verse 34. It says that if you fear uh, some kind of disobedience from your wives, it says if you fear. That's not what it means. That's not what it means in, in Arabic. All of the mufassirun are in agreement that it means if a woman has entered into a state of gross disobedience, and this doesn't mean disobedience to her husband, disobedience to God. Then the husband is told first to do wa'ad, wa'iduhunna, to, to admonish them, to tell them, please, don't do this. And then it says, wa'hjuruhunna fin madaji'. And then it says that leave them in the beds, don't have intimacy with them. Now the third in that verse says, Wadribuhunna. It uses a word darb in the Arabic language. Now, unfortunately, the Arabs, most Arabs, because I spend a lot, lot of time in the Arabic world, most Arabs do not know Quranic Arabic. They know their own whatever they speak, Ammiya, Darija. Most do not know Quranic Arabic. Words in Arabic have many, many meanings. The word darb in Arabic has several meanings. For instance, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرَاغَ عَلَيْهِمْ ضَرْبًا بِالْيَمِينَ About Ibrahim alayhi salam. He went to the idols and struck them with his right hand. That's what it says. The Quran also says, يَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ They strike the earth. In other words, they travel. The Quran says, ضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمَ ذِلَّتُهُ وَالْمَسْكَنَةِ They suffered humiliation and impoverishment. ضُرِبَتْ it doesn't mean that humiliation and poverty started beating them up, but they were knocked down by it. So it's used metaphorically. The Quran says that the angels, Yadribuna wujuhahum wa adbarahum, the hypocrites, they get their faces, they smite their faces and their backs. But it also says, Darabullahu methalan, God strikes a similitude. It's used as a metaphor. So, in Arabic, this word can mean many, many different things. So what does it mean in the verse? Well, first of all, you have to understand the verse, according to Ibn Ashur, was actually designed to eliminate domestic violence. And that is why the great irony is it's used to justify domestic violence. Because nobody and anybody that tells you violence against your own spouse is justifiable in Islam is not only a liar, but he's, ab he's absolutely disparaging the messenger of Allah who was sent as a mercy to all the world and certainly a mercy to women. So to say that this means that you can beat your wife, that you can be violent in your own home, a place where she should feel safer than any other place, how could that have anything to do with ma arsalnaka illa rahmatin lil alameen? We only sent you as a mercy to all the world. How can that have anything to do with a man about whom his companion said, 
لن يض لا لم يضرب رسول الله امرأة ولا غلاما ولا ولدا قط. The Messenger of Allah never struck a woman, a child, or a servant ever. صلى الله عليه وسلم. ولا قد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة. And you have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. You have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. So what does that verse mean? First of all, the ulama say the wow there, which normally does not, benefits the tartib. In other words, that it actually means you do this, then you do this, then you do this. First of all, I guarantee you, nobody has ever hit their wife working out some progressive thing. Well, first I'll try this, and then I'll try this, and then I'll try this. That's not how domestic violence occurs. Domestic violence occurs when somebody loses his temper and punches somebody. That's domestic violence. So the first thing the Quran is telling you, stop and think about this. That will stop domestic violence. Now, in that verse, according to Ata, one of the greatest mufassirun of the Quran, he said it doesn't mean hit, he said it means get angry. In other words, once you've gone through this, then you should let her know this is serious. Because the nushuz, according to the commentators, nishazat means irtafa'at, to rise up against. It means to get arrogant with. So if a wife is becoming arrogant with a husband, or vice versa, because the Quran says that a husband can become arrogant with the wife. It goes both ways. If the wife becomes arrogant with the husband, then the husband is told, do this, then this, then this. According to Ata, he said that that third one was then you have to let her know. But what does it say immediately after that? It says, that if you fear shiqaq baynihima, right? If you fear separation, who's the you? The people that are responsible. فَبْعَثُ حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Bring an arbitrator from her side, an arbitrator from his side, and let them work this out. And then Allah says, وَإِنْ يُرِدَا إِصْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا and if the two sides want to rectify, God will give them tawfiq. God will give them providential care, will help them rectify. But if one side doesn't, separate them. Separate them. Let them go. The Quran says, Imsakum bi ma'roof, aw tusriihum bi ihsan. Hold on to them in a good way, or let them go in a good way. But don't leave them mu'allaqa suspended. This is a major problem. Not just in our community, in all these communities. If you read the statistics about domestic violence, it's deeply depressing. Now most of you in, in here, and I'm assuming the ladies also, probably have very nice marital relationships. That's the way my household has been. My wife and I don't fight. We've been married 22 years. We've nev she's never struck me. I've never struck her. Never, not once. It does, that doesn't have to be the way things are. But if people are in a situation where they can't get along, they have to let go. This is Islam. <laughs> Islam is a mercy. We've got all these people out there just really suffering like they're in hell. And some people making religion a hell for the women. Wallahi, we have imams on the mimbars preaching this stuff. I've heard pre preachers say, Wallahi, I've heard people say, oh, there's some women, the only thing that benefits is striking. First of all, it's makru to even do the tap. But the Prophet said, darban ghayra mubarrih. Why doesn't anybody ever translate that word or explain what people mean? They say it means tabriyah is to do harm, to be violent, or to do it out of anger. That's what it means. So even to do that, like to a child, just like a slap. That's a darb. In, in, in Arabic, when you do tayammum, it's called darba. Darbat al-ula wa darbat al-thaniya. Right? This is what they teach in the books of fiqh. You tap the earth like this. That's a darba. But to say that you can strike a woman physically and harm her, leave some trace on her, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim That's not Islam. It's jahiliya. It's jahiliya. And there's people that do these things. And these poor women have to suffer the humiliation. 
Ibn Ashur in his tafsir says, and I believe this, he says it is absolutely acceptable for the authorities in charge to prescribe a punishment, to prescribe a punishment for any act of domestic violence. And he says when men are no longer vigilant <coughs> about controlling themselves, when he said when they use this verse as a means to express their anger, their rage, and their vengeance on a woman, then he says it's the time for the authorities to come in. And that's why any woman who's suffering domestic abuse has every right to go to the proper authorities. If the Muslims won't help her, then she can go to the police or anybody else. Because nobody, nobody walking on two feet, not even an animal on four feet or crawling on the earth, should ever be humiliated, should ever be tortured, should ever be struck violently. This is a major problem in our community. We need to think deeply. And mu'minun, ba'dhumu al mu'minun wal mu'minat ba'dhumu awliya u ba'd. The believing men and women protect one another. Protect one another. That's what wilaya is. You protect each other. That's the believing men and believing women. To uh, introduce uh, Sheikh Hamza, which I consider to be a student of his as I was doing my PhD. So please welcome uh, Sheikh Hamza. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله I want to welcome also Sheikh Nabil Mahfouz who was here uh, at really at the inception also and worked tirelessly during that time and he is the uh, son of uh, our Sheikh and teacher Abdullah bin Bayya who's uh, really been an inspiration for me and many others and is finally being recognized for the extraordinary scholar that he is. I want to uh, say a few words about education and what it means to be educated. My, my father, who had a major influence on me in terms of my understanding of education, was a student of a great educator. Uh, whose name was Mark Van Dorn. He actually named me after him and at Columbia University they give every year the Van Doren uh, Excellency in Teaching Award. Um, he was a teacher from the 1920s until the late 50s at Columbia and he wrote an extraordinary text on liberal education and what that means. Uh, Van Doren was in a tradition in America which is known as the great books tradition. The idea of studying the foundational texts of Western civilization and that that really is the, 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 the grounding for understanding where we are, how we got here. Knowing the roots will help you understand the fruit, whether it's bitter or sweet, healthy or unhealthy. You will know uh, why the fruit you are producing is as it is if you look at the uh, educational archaeology, if you just look back and see where you've come from. But my father said to me recently, in fact last year, he said, my education's finally over. And he's 85 years old. Now, he's somebody who spent his life reading over and over and over again the same books that he studied in the three years that he was with Van Doren in his class. And he actually took permission to sit in those classes after. Van Doren studied from the Bible all the way up to uh, Sigmund Freud and some of the 20th century um, writers. But he literally went through the entire corpus of Western intellectual tradition. And in some ways, what Zaytuna is, for me anyway, it is about the same thing in terms of our own Islamic tradition. And we tend to forget in the West that Islamic tradition is part of Western tradition. 
It's something that has been denied for a long time. There are some people like George Muktasi that had the courage, the intellectual academic courage, to admit that. But it's evident in our mathematics. Although some try to say uh, Indian numerals, these are Arabic numerals, and they will remain Arabic. It's evident in our names that we give the stars, like al Tayr from Al-Tayr, and Al-Dabaran from Al-Dabaran, and Ibt al -Jawza, which we call Beetlejuice, because they couldn't pronounce Ibt al -Jawza, so it's called Beetlejuice, right? So the, even when we look up in the, in the heavens, we're looking at the influence of the Islamic civilization on the West. When we look at our numbers, when we crunch numbers, we are looking at the influence of Islamic civilization on the West. This is undeniable. And so what we're doing really here is reestablishing part of the Western tradition. We are reestablishing it where it belongs, right here, because it is part of the story of the West. And to deny that part is to deny a member of your family that you're either ashamed of or you don't know anything about. You're ignorant of, like the long-lost uncle that shows up. I didn't know I had you. Right? Jane Eyre's inheritance from her uncle that she doesn't know that she has. So it's important for us to ask that question, what is education? Because in the West, we are in a crisis. And to deny that crisis is to deny what is so obvious in front of us because all you have to do is walk outside and go down the road and look at these frat houses when the colleges, the university is opening up and you look at the type of behavior that's going on in adults, not children. These are 18, 19, 20, 21, some of them close to their 30s that are behaving not like infants. I don't know what, what adjective to use, but for me it's very tragic to see a loss of dignity because this is central to what education is about. Education is about learning to carry yourself. What used to be called in this culture comportment, we don't even use that word in English anymore, but on my great-grandmother's report card from 1882 in a high school in Wichita in uh, Wisconsin, the very first thing that she was graded on was comportment, which comes from a Latin word, how you carry yourself. We call that in the Islamic tradition, adab. Adab. The adib is the one who is disciplined in himself and somebody who speaks with discipline. He knows how to put words in its proper place. A thing for every place and a place for everything. So, what is education? In Arabic we say tarbiyah with ta'lim. Tarbiyah comes from the same root word that Lord comes from, Rabb. Allah is the murabbi, the one that nurtures, the one that causes to grow. To nurture a student, to watch them grow intellectually, spiritually, morally. Ta'lim is from a word which means to make an impression. Allama means to impress on something. Alama is mark. The cuneiform writing was by pushing into the clay and creating an impression. And that is a mark. So he makes his mark on society. We use the same term in English. That is what ta'lim is about. It is about impressions that impact students, that have an effect, that take an effect. If we look at what the root word in Latin of educare, edu educate, educare, which means to lead out of. In other words, to draw out what is already in there. The idea that you cannot really teach anybody anything. You can only make them remember what they already know. And that's why the Quran is called a dhikr. Because it is a reminder of what we already know. Alastu bi rabbikum. Bala shahidna. Am I not your Lord? We all know that. We need to be reminded of that truth. Education is about remembering, making whole. When you look at the boredom that exists in modern American education, you look at the boredom of the students, you look at the, the faces that they carry to school, you look at them, and I've been in classes, I've taught, I've lectured all over the United States, in universities all over the United States. You look at their faces, 
and you look at the boredom. One, because they're wondering, why am I studying this? What is this for? What's the purpose of this? The smart ones check out early on, like Bill Gates, who never got a degree from Harvard because he dropped out. That's what happens to the smart ones. Steve Jobs dropped out. All of these billionaires, they dropped out because they learned early on, I want to make money and this is not the way to make money. So if you go to college to earn a livelihood, you're wasting your time. You're even now being encouraged to drop out by some of the leading, by some of the leading CEOs in America, encouraging students to drop out, open sourcing, because most of what these students are, are learning in school will not apply to anything. It's not going to give them some kind of vocational training. And this is the reality. There is a strong argument that college now is obsolete. And this is being put forward. Much of what students are learning, why are they studying geometry? Geometry makes absolutely no sense anymore. Lord Alfred Whitehead, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 19th and 20th century, said that the single most important form of mathematics in the modern world is statistics. And they don't even teach that in high school. And yet a junior high school student could master it. It's not a difficult subject. Statistics is determining so much of what is around us. They're using statistics constantly, and yet students are not taught statistics until they take a course in college. They might have a little bit in college, in, in high school, but it's, it's, it's not much. Why are they studying geometry? Why study algebra? They're, what, they're sitting there wondering, what does this mean? Why am I doing this? Why do I care what uh, 2x plus 3x equals? I don't care because there is no overarching meaning to all of these things. There is no real educational philosophy behind these things. If you look historically, the, all of these things had meaning. And I'll just give you a quick example. We call these the liberal arts. All of us, I think, on this panel have a BA. Does anybody have a BS? All right. Yeah, I won't hold it against you. A BA is a Bachelor of Arts. If you ask anybody that has a Bachelor of Arts, what is the arts that you're a bachelor in? They will not be able to tell you. They won't even know that arts comes from a word which means tool, tool. Arma, army is, is from the same root. Arithmetic is the same root. Arithmetic is ars metrica, the tool to measure by. So the liberal arts are liberating tools. They're tools that free your mind from the, the inherent prejudices of the mind. Now, the liberal arts was distinguished from the servile arts, vocational training, where you go to college to learn how to do something as a vocation. And these were the servile arts because they were simply things that you learned and then you could go out and earn a livelihood through those things. This is largely what the college and the university has become in the West. It is no longer a place to pursue truth. It's a place to pursue money. And because those making the most money are those who are most adept at cheating, cheating has become widespread in our schools and universities. This is a major problem. When I found out from my son that cheating was widespread in one of the best high schools in uh, the state of California, I was very distraught by it because I went to a school where our teacher purposely walked out of the classroom during the test in high school and said, you are on your honor, boys. There was no monitoring at the high school I went to. It was a Catholic high school. No monitoring. You are on your honor, boys. When I was mentioning this to a student at Stanford in medical school, he said, oh, that's no big deal. I cheated my whole way through high school. And I said to him, are you cheating your way through medical school now? Because that's very disturbing to me. Because, I, seriously, when I was in high school, I didn't think of cheating and the people that I was in school with, I'm sure one or two people might have done that, but I was not with people that did that as a practice. Because I was taught by my mother, you don't cheat. Not because you're going to go to hell, but because honesty is the best policy. It wasn't related to religion. It was simply related to being a human being, a mensch. 
So the liberal arts were there to train people to use their intellect so they could pursue the truth for the rest of their lives. Muhammad ibn Hassan said, our tradition is a tradition of learning from the cradle to the grave. If you're not prepared to commit yourself from the cradle to the grave, then don't bother trying to learn our tradition. So when my father said at the age of 84 that his education was done, he was talking about a tradition within the West of the liberal arts. Mortimer Adler, who was one of my teachers and one of his teachers and a close friend of Van Doren, said that it takes at least 60 years to be, become educated. You don't get an education from high school. You don't get an education from university. You're not going to get an education from Zaytuna. But if Zaytuna does its job, you will get the tools to become educated. And those tools will last you. Because this is what learning is about. Now, just to give you an example of what our tradition is about. When I was 23 years old in the Sahara Desert, I was with a teacher of mine who's a Bedouin. He grew up moving. They had about three or four places that they moved to and he had what's called a madrasa mutanaqila, a college, a mobile college. There were times when there were over a thousand students. If you went there at two in the morning from two till fajr, all you would hear is the recitation of the students around fire uh, that they had made. Literally. And I'm not, I'm not making this up. When I was sitting, I was studying a, a text in Aqidah, but there was somebody ahead of me who was studying a text in advanced Aqidah. And he was studying the section on Al-Jawahar Al-Fard, which are the particles that make up existence, because in our tradition, Imam Al-Baqallani and others, which comes out of the Mu'tazilite initially, but Imam Al-Baqallani formulated an atomic theory of the world. In fact, in, in the history of the atom, a book written by a Cambridge professor of physics, in the history of the atom, he argues that the Islamic atomic theory is a unique theory in which they cannot find the historical precedence for it. The atomic theory that came out of, of Islamic civilization. The Jawahar al-Fard are not atoms that we know today that can be split. They are the particles that make up existence. They are the quanta of existence. When this young Bedouin was asking him, what does that mean? Murabt al-Hajj picked up sand and he threw it up in the air. And he said, this, if we could see, have the veils removed, we would see that everything that we can see, touch and feel is like these particles of dust in the air. This is what our Islamic teaching was doing to Bedouins. So what was, what was it doing to the scholars of Al-Qayrawiyyin, the scholars of Al-Azhar, of the Nidamiya? If that's what, what it gave the Bedouin, a concept of the atomic world, what was it doing in other places? We believe that education is rooted in the sacred. If you cut it off from the sacred, you destroy education. It has no meaning. This is what our students all over this country know in their heart of hearts. They cannot articulate it, but they know it. I am studying something that does not have meaning because you have not told me why I am studying this. It can't simply to make, be to make money because there are much more intelligent things to study if you want to make money than algebra or geometry. So if those liberal arts of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, which, which were the foundation of the Islamic tradition, we are a language-based tradition, signs. And the two signs that we speak, humans speak, we have two types of signs. We have language signs and number signs. And we call these the language arts and the arts of mathematics. This was traditionally what was education in the West and in the Muslim world. These were the tools of education. In the Christian West, it was to understand ultimately God's revelation through the Bible. In the Muslim East and West, it was to understand God's revelation through the Quran. That's what we're committed to. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give us tawfiq. In the end, I would just ask you all to read this book. If you want to understand what has happened in this country, 
why our students are increasingly incapable of thinking, why they can't reason, why we have some of the worst test scores all over the world, even though I'm totally against the testing, but even by the metrics of their own system, their system is failing. So weapons of mass instruction, a school teacher's journey through the dark world of compulsory schooling. I don't know how many of you know about the Tuskegee syphilis study, which was where physicians in this country injected syphilis into African Americans to see the effects over time. It's a well-known study. But only recently we found out not only that were they doing it in Mississippi, they were also doing it in Guatemala. In 1947, they were injecting people down in Central America with syphilis, gonorrhea, and other diseases to see the effects of these diseases on these people. These were scientists that were produced by the best colleges in the United States of America. The same colleges that produced the people that robbed all of you who own, own homes in this country, robbed you of your equity. The same people. These are the products of American universities. And until we deal with the fact that without teaching people meaning, without teaching people purpose, you create monsters. You create the disease known as civilization. This is what happens when you divorce education from the sacred. People talk about sacrificing and they don't even know the root meaning of that sacros facere, to make sacred. When you sacrifice in your life, you are doing it for the sacred. We can't get out of these meanings because they're embedded in the very language that we speak. And that's what's lacking. And until we reestablish the true roots of learning and knowledge and why we're learning and what is the purpose of knowledge, we will see it get worse and worse and worse. Muslims have an incredible opportunity right now because we are a people that still, in spite of ourselves, because of our Prophet وسلم, because when he said one of the signs of the end of time is that people will study for other than the sake of God. They will go to school for other than the sake of God because every civilization, Hindu, Buddhist, Confucianist, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim, all of them understood that learning was to make a better human being. Learning was not to make more money. It was to make a better human being. Not for learning's sake. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khair. I'd uh, like to conclude the program with uh, a dua from Imam Zaid, and we're going to be praying Maghrib, so I want you to wait until we finish the dua and do the closing. For the Maghrib prayer, we'll have two groups praying. Uh, once we finish, you could go in the back. There will be a group that will go downstairs to pray uh, in the back, and then another group will be praying in the back part of the stage. So after the dua and the closing, inshallah, we'll pray Maghrib prayer. Imam Zaid. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen All praises due to Almighty God the Lord of all the worlds Was salatu was salam and blessings and peace ala Sayyidina upon our exemplary leader Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah we will pray. Uh, first of all, we pray. Allahumma iftah alayna futuh al-arifin. Allah, Almighty God, open our hearts in the way that you open the hearts of those who experienced your reality in their life. And... We pray that the fruits of education are, belong to all of us. 
and as a result we become enlightened people and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or before that one of our great Imams who mentioned this earlier in a couplet of poetry that's attributed to him Imam al-Shafi'i Rahimahullah he mentions شَاكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِئِنْ سُوءَ حِفْظِي فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي فَأَخْبَرَنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورْ نُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُحْدَى لِلْعَاصِي that I complain to my teacher Waqi'ah that my memory is dulling a little bit and all of these great Imams and leaders and scholars had photographic memories he instructed me to leave off all sin and we discussed this earlier how character, morality and the pursuit of knowledge as Sheikh Hamza just mentioned cannot be separated from each other فَأَخْبَرْنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورِ He told me that knowledge is a light نُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُحْدَى لِلْآسِي The light of Almighty God that He doesn't give to a sinner So the moral quest and the intellectual quest are, are inseparable Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Two almost identical hadith, there's only one word differing between them. Innama bu'ithtu mu'alliman, I've been sent only as a teacher. Innama bu'ithtu li'utammima makarim al-akhlaq. Okay, there are a few more words differing. I've only been sent to perfect good character. And these are not contradictory. If we say innama is a limiting particle, they're not contradictory because one is inseparable from the other. So that nur, that light that Imam al-Shafi mentioned, we pray for that light in the words of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the blessings and peace of Almighty God be upon him. Allahumma ja'al fi qulubina nura. Allah, Almighty God, place light in our hearts. Wa fi absarina nura, and place light in our vision. Wa fi asma'ina nura, and place light in our hearing. Wa aymanina nura, and to our right light. Wa shama'ilina nura, and to our left light. Wa bayna aydina nura, and place light before us. وَمِنْ خَلْفِنَا نُورًا And place light behind us. وَمِنْ فَوْقِنَا نُورًا And place light above us. وَمِنْ تَحْتِنَا نُورًا And place light beneath us. اللهم اجعل لنا جميعا نورا O Allah, make for all of us a light with which we walk through the enveloping darkness of this world. وَآخَرَ دَعْوَانَا in the last of our prayers, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, is all praise is for Almighty God, the Lord of all the worlds. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira al Fatiha. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Jazakumullah uh, khair. We look forward to your continued engagement with Zaytuna College. It's your college. And with your dua, inshallah, we will be successful. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام uh, First of all I want to uh, thank the, uh, the hosts all of the distinguished uh, professors that are here this uh, wonderful center of knowledge which I was uh, made to understand that this is the largest uh, university in Malaysia. Uh, this is also a wonderful auditorium to be speaking and also to see so many young faces out here. It always uh, inspires me to see the young people that are willing to come out to hear a discussion or a lecture or to participate in something of that nature as opposed to spending their evening watching television, which is uh, what a lot of people tend to do these days. The, the, the topic, and I think Dr. Delp uh, was, spoke very eloquently towards the, 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 the purpose of the evening. We, uh, we also prepared some uh, thoughts for an academic uh, audience, and I, I think there's quite a few students here. So I'm gonna modify what I was going to talk about a little bit, but the, the basic idea of the crisis of knowledge is that there are many problems in the world. We have economic problems. Currently we have uh, very serious political problems. One of the problems that we have right now is in Ukraine, which in some ways is, is a deeply troubling uh, crisis right now because these are the, the situations that in the past have very easily led to major conflagrations. People tend to forget that it was the assassination of the heir of the Habsburg Empire that ignited World War I, which led to countless deaths, that it was the German invasion of Poland, uh, which they considered actually to be Lebensraum or uh, German living room. They were reconquering what they felt to be part of the previous German Empire that was dismantled after World War I, and people tend to forget that World War II was actually a direct result of World War I. And um, the, uh, the utter humiliation that the Germans suffered at the hands of the, uh, the conquering powers at the Treaty of Versailles. So these events led to over 100 million people being killed uh, during the 20th century. But if you actually look at these problems, they were always a failure of the political class at solving problems that were, in essence, not just simply political problems, but, but deeper than that. And this is part of the, the, the trouble that we have, is that we no longer define uh, our, our terms anymore. We no longer look at these human illnesses that we have at a deep level. We look at them at a very superficial level. And so we have economic problems, but they're addressed at a very superficial level. For instance, the recent massive crisis, which Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, who was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States and did his PhD on the Great Depression, recently came out admitting that the cr financial crisis of 2008 was greater than the financial crisis of 1929, October 1929, that began the Great Depression. But instead of addressing the problem at the roots, instead what was done was to ignore the, the deep problems of the financial structures and institutions and to simply bail out uh, the criminals that perpetrated uh, great financial crimes against large numbers of people, not just in the United States, but around the globe. And there were people here in Malaysia that were affected by that crisis. Uh, the Irish people uh, were made to bail out 
uh, banks in, 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 in mainland Europe that had nothing to do with, with Ireland, but their uh, political class uh, accepted this. One of the few countries that actually did anything was Iceland, <laughs> where they put the banksters in jail. So the, and, and they refused to pay the English banks for crimes that were committed against their population by uh, people that were unethical. So instead of addressing the economic problems at a deep philosophical level, which is understanding first and foremost the economic system that you have at its philosophical base, because any institution you has has a philosophical understanding. There's a philosophy behind consumerism. There's a philosophy behind capitalism. There's a philosophy behind despotism. And unless you understand the philosophies behind those, when, when the problems of those institutions arise, you can't address them properly because you don't understand the problem. Any physician knows that etiology and diagnoses go together. You have to understand what caused the disease before you can treat the disease. And you cannot, if, 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 you, if somebody comes to you with malaria and you treat them for malaria and then you send them back to the malarial swamp to simply be reinfected again, that is not treating a person. That's not treating the cause. And so looking at a deeper problem it's very important. Now, one of the major problems in the crisis of, of knowledge is that knowledge has been defined by a materialistic, hegemonic civilization that does not, know, that does not acknowledge other forms of knowledge. So, for instance, in our tradition, as well as the tradition that Dr. Delp was trained in, it, which is the, the, the Catholic tradition, in our tradition, our epistemology is very different from the epistemological assumptions of the current dominant model around the globe. But if we don't understand the epistemological assumptions, if we simply go to these universities and we imbibe what's being taught without having the critical skills to understand and, analyze, and analyze these things, then we become victims of worldviews that were engendered by others that do not share the same first principles that we share. If we don't know our first principles, if we don't know what our methodologies are, if we don't know what the epistemology of Islam is, if we don't know how we view truth and what is truth, if we don't know these things, then they're easily, that ignorance is easily replaced by another type of ignorance, which is a compounded ignorance. It's learning things that are simply wrong. Our scholars differentiated between simple ignorance and between compounded ignorance. Al-Jahal al-Murakkab wa al-Jahal al-Basit. Jahal al-Basit is, is the ignorance that somebody who knows they're ignorant has. And this, uh, Dr. Naqib al-Attas calls it innocent ignorance. It's something that can be remedied. But compounded ignorance is an ignorance where somebody is ignorant and they're also ignorant of their ignorance. And this is, this is a much deeper problem. And so one of the great tragedies of, of modern human beings, uh, we have a, a, a cult film in the United States which is called The Wizard of Oz, which every American child has to see year after year until they're fully indoctrinated into the worldview of The Wizard of Oz. But one of the things about The Wizard of Oz is there's a scarecrow who's looking for a brain. He, he, and he says, if I only had a brain with the thoughts I, I'd be thinking, I could be another Lincoln if I only had a brain. So he's looking for a brain. Well, he never finds the brain, but at the end, the wizard gives him a piece of paper. And he says, in, 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 in my country back home in Kansas, when somebody doesn't have a brain, we confer upon him a diploma. And, and, and this is very often what happens in our universities. Brainless people are given pieces of paper to convince them that they have a brain. But the reality of it is they're actually more ignorant coming out of the university than they were going in. Because when they went into the university, they had innocent ignorance. But by the time they come out of the university, they have this compounded ignorance. 
And this is one of, to me, one of the great crimes of the modern educational institutions, that people are deprived of a true education. They're given what they think is an education, educare, to lead out of. You cannot teach people what they don't already know. That learning in our tradition is remembering. It's tadhakkur. It's a recollection of something that we already know. And this is why the Quran says, وَذِكِّرْ Remind. Make them remember what they already knew. What is it that we already knew? We knew a covenant that we took in another dimension. It was a sacred covenant. And it began with, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? And we replied as spirits, we replied in the affirmative, Bala shahidna. Indeed, you are our Lord and we witness to this. We're brought into this world and the world is a place of remembrance. It is to remember a previous existence. It is to recollect, to recall. This is why we call dhikrullah dhikrullah, because we're remembering what we already knew. You cannot remember something that you did not know previously. And this is the highest form of knowledge in our tradition. It is to know your Lord. This is not being taught in the modern institutions of learning. They have completely removed God from academia. They have removed God from the social sciences, they have removed God from the physical sciences, and they have certainly removed God from the ethical uh, traditions that are, are, are taught today and inevitably lead for anybody that has an intellect to moral relativism based on how they're taught. So uh, in the Muslim world, we have adopted alien worldviews. These are not the world views of our own tradition. They have been given to us by people that have come to certain conclusions about the world. One of them is that the world is purely the material world. It's a quantitative world and this is why they, they worship the quantitative sciences over the qualitative sciences. But in the Islamic tradition, while a human being is meant to be literate in both, qualitative and quantitative aspects of life because we are beings of meaning but dimension. We have comprehension and extension. We have quality and we have quantity. And therefore both of them are, are, are important. To have literate people but also to have numerate people is important. And this is why the numerate sciences, the, the quantitative sciences are important. But our tradition always gave precedent over the qualitative sciences. And, and the single most important of all these sciences was language. Language. This is what makes us human. What makes us human is that we are articulate beings. We are beings that can communicate. But what is the secret of our communication? When we were told in the Quran, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, the angels asked, Will you put in the earth those who sow corruption and shed blood? It's interesting that their question involved corruption and shedding blood, which look around the globe now how widespread these two phenomena are. Corruption and bloodshed. We have corruption, unfortunately, the Muslim countries, the, the corruption indices that are done in the Scandinavian countries on a yearly basis, the Muslim countries are some of the most corrupt, they are in fact considered to be the most corrupt countries in the world. In fact, on average, Nigeria is always takes first place. And Pakistan generally comes in second. But I have a Pakistani friend who informed me that the Pakistanis bribed the Nigerians to take first place. <laughs> so this, this is a big problem. This is a major problem that we have. Now, the other is the shedding of blood. And so the angels ask this question. This is istifham, it's not i'tirab. They're asking to understand because they were looking at the beings that were on earth before humans, which were the jinn, and this is what the jinn did. The jinn were here before us, and they, 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 they were corrupt, and they shed blood. And so the human being was put here to replace them. 
Now, what's interesting about this replacement, the, the, the angel said, We praise you and we, we deem you holy and transcendent beyond any description, that this is what we do. Allah says, قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I know what you do not know. And this is important, that the word that is used is, I know what you do not know. And then the very next thing is, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَى And God taught man, Adam, all of the names. This, this is the secret of the human being, that we have the ability to abstract. We have the ability to see the one in the many. The only way that we can communicate is by seeing the one in the many. When we talk, when we talk about a lecture, see, you, you, you knew that there was a lecture tonight. How do you know what a lecture is? How do you know what a lecture is? If I say there's a lecture on the crises of knowledge, how do you know what a crisis is? How do you know what knowledge is? Because you have abstracted the one out of the many. There are many types of crises, but they share common qualities. And that enables us to speak intelligently about the oneness, the, the unified nature of crises. It enables us to speak about the unified nature of knowledge. We are unifiers by nature. This is what we do as human beings. We are muwahidun. We are constantly making one. And how do we make one? We make one through language. We can only communicate because of the oneness of language. And this is why the ultimate abstraction is to recognize that this diverse creation also has a source. Just as every crisis, we can abstract the essence of a crisis. We can abstract the essence of a crisis out of all these diverse crises. We can also abstract the essence of existence out of all this diversity. And the essence of existence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is our Lord. He is not creation. He is the creator of creation. But it's through His creation that we know Him. This is the crisis of knowledge. We have failed to see our Lord in His creation. We have failed to see our Lord in this extraordinary theater of manifestation that He has given us to come to know Him in the short time that we tarry here. Muslims are a theocentric civilization. Our lives are meant to revolve around God. We are becoming like other previous civilizations, a narcissistic civilization, a, a civilization that re revolves around me. This is the, the child civilization. This is the age of the child. We're living in the age of the infant. But this is a tyrannical infant. It's not because we look at children, we have in, in English we talk about, I don't know if you have this distinction in, in, in the Malay language, but in English we talk about childlike and childish. Childlike is a very positive quality, but childish is a very negative quality because a child has an innocence that we all recognize because it has yet to be tainted by the world. It, it, it's a sinless being. But the childish nature, the childish nature is the tyrannical nature of the self. This is nafs al-amara. This is the nafs, this is the ego that does not share. This is the ego that sees that it is the only thing in existence and everything is peripheral to its own existence. This is what the child needs to be educated out of. This is the essence of education, is to draw the true nature, the true innocence of the child, the bara'at al-asliya of the child into existence. And this is done in our tradition. We have no word that, that corresponds to the word education. There is no word in the history of Islam that corresponds to the English word education. We have two concepts that are always kept together, tarbiyah with ta'lim, the idea of nurturing and the idea of, of educating. In other words, you cannot separate the nurturing process from the process of education. And this is why they were always, they went together, the murabbi, the mu'addib, 
The muallim went together. The teacher was a spiritual mentor as well as being an intellectual mentor. You cannot separate the spirit from the intellect because the intellect in and of itself is a spiritual phenomenon. It is not a material phenomenon. Consciousness is spiritual. The, 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 very, the, the very center of the human being this core that, that Allah calls the lub, ul al-albab, is a immaterial reality. It is a spiritual reality. And so the, the murabbi was the, the one who took you by degrees, who brought you out of yourself. And this is why madrasa in Arabic means the place of effacement. It's the place where the negative qualities are effaced and the positive qualities are inculcated. They called the first stage of education tahliya, the emptying out of the self. And the second stage was tahliya, the adorning of the self with those beautiful qualities. What the, uh, the, the ancients called truth, goodness, and beauty. What we call iman, islam, and ihsan. Iman is our truth. There is no God but Allah. Islam is the way that we behave with goodness in the world. And Ihsan is the, 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 the profound need for the human being to make things beautiful and also to recognize beauty. And this, this, is, this is the human condition. But if you look at the current world today, everywhere you look, there are two powers ruling. There is the irascible power and the concupiscent power. There is the, 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 the dog soul. This is what Imam al-Ghazali called the dog soul and the pig soul. These are the two powers that are reigning. The people that are consuming and, and not recognizing that their consumption is killing them. And then the people that are effecting their rage on the world literally going out and, and, and with rage in the world. The warmongers, the warmongers, whether they're spreading the weapons of war, and we know in our tradition that it's prohibited to sell weapons during times of civil strife in, in fiqh. The vast majority of ulama said it's prohibited to sell weapons when people are fighting because Islam does not encourage fighting. It encourages it encourages ending fighting. Every time they raise the, the flames of fire, God put those flames out. Muslims are supposed to want to put the flames of war out, not to ignite the flames of war. This verse that was recited at the beginning, and it was an interesting choice from, uh, from uh, Surah at tawbah but this verse that was recited at the beginning is a good example. You see, the, the Quran says, فَلْيَجِدُ غِلْظَ You know, they, the, the disbelievers will find harshness in these people. This is only during actual fighting. <laughs> but there are now Muslims that believe that this is simply the way we're supposed to be behave with non-Muslims. Whereas the, the Quran tells us, That God doesn't prohibit you from showing those who don't oppose you and persecute you religiously, right? That you show righteousness towards them and that you actually give them a portion of your wealth. This is what Qadi Abu Bakr in his Ahkam al Quran says. Tuqsitu ilayhim means to be just, but he also says, That you can actually help them when they're in need. We just recently. I've been mentioning this for years, but just recently I was glad to see it. There's a Turkish filmmaker that wants to make a film highlighting the fact that in the 1840s, in 1847, the, 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 the great uh, Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Majid, sent shiploads of, of aid to the Irish during the Irish famine and, and set pounds, uh, money, to help them. This is one of it, 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 this was before the idea of, of global charity. This was before the idea of actually helping other people. And I would challenge anybody to show me uh, many examples of this in human history where people are suffering in one place and people in another place find out about it and want to help them out. This is a very modern phenomenon, the idea of aid. But Sultan Abdul Majid, he had an Irish doctor who told him about the suffering of the Irish people during the potato famine. 
And the, the, the Anglo-Saxon people in England were not only not helping them, but in fact, they, they were actually happy about it because it was removing a problem that they had, which is the Irish problem. If you don't believe me, just read A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift to see, the, although it's a sarcastic piece, it, 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 it identifies the sentiment of many English about the Irish. So this ship was sent to Ireland, and the English were so bothered by it, they actually prohibited from being allowed to dock in, 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 in their, their, uh, their uh, shores in Ireland. So the English that were controlling Ireland at the time did not want to, the, the aid from Turkey to come to the Irish. And so they had to, the, the Ottomans went down and they snuck it into a southern harbor. And that city today has a plaque reminding people of that fact. That th th this, is, this, is, this is mercy. And this is based on a Quranic injunction that human beings, wherever they are, should be helped. Algeria, during the great famine of, of France at the beginning of the 19th century, out the, the Bay of Algeria sent massive amounts of wheat from Algeria to France to help them because they were suffering, even though they were their enemies at the time. But there's something that transcends the animosity of, of politics, and that is the necessity for us to reveal our humanity, to be muhtinun, to be people that do beautiful acts of goodness, of kindness. This is, this is the essence of human beings. The Prophet ﷺ was called a mercy to all the world. We only sent you as a mercy to all the world. This is our Prophet. He was a mercy. In fact, one, you have a, a brilliant uh, Afghani scholar here, and you're fortunate to have him, Dr. Kamali, uh, who writes extensively on Maqasid al-Sharia. Uh, I, I had the good fortune of having lunch with him today. But one of the things that he says is the two fundamental Maqasid of Islam are Rahmah and Huda, mercy and guidance. And I would argue that really they can be, be collapsed into one because guidance in, in itself is a mercy. That the reason God has given us guidance is because He's merciful. And the Quran begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim It doesn't begin, Bismillah ar-Rahman al-Hadi. It begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, to emphasize using two attributes of mercy, that that is the essence of our Lord is mercy. And the essence of His Prophet is mercy. And so Muslims, this is the tarbiyah. Tarbiyah is inculcating mercy. It's taking the child out of its cruelty. It's taking it out of its selfishness into a, a sharing creature, a creature that wants to serve others instead of be served by others. And then the ta'lim is the huda. So tarbiyah and ta'lim is rahmah and huda. It's mercy and guidance. This is the essence of our tradition. And guidance is, is, is something that we cannot live without. And because we're imitative creatures, we imitate what we see. Now we have demons teaching our children. We have demons. If anybody came to your house and knocked on the door, and you opened it up, and, and they looked like Madonna, or, or Britney Spears, or any of these people, uh, Russell Brand, you know, you know these people because we're in a global civilization. But if any of them knocked on your door and said, excuse me, do you mind if I come inside and just entertain your children for a few hours? Which mad person would say, oh, of course, tafatul. Even with the wonderful Malay hospitality, you wouldn't do that. You'd say, get the hell out of here, and you would slam the door on them. You know, who does he think he is, or who does she think he is? And yet, so many of us simply turn on the television and plop these little children in front of this mindless box and, and literally allow a, uh, strangers from a whole other civilization with a whole other set of agenda, agendas to, to raise our children. I was once studying the uh, Disney Channel because Disney Channel is everywhere. And it really struck me as odd that, that this obsession with, with spreading your message all over the world so that Mickey Mouse, which I believe is going to be burned in hell with the other idols, that Mickey Mouse is part of global civilization. You know, a mouse is not exactly something that w traditionally we've looked up to. <laughs> you know, it's not Mickey the lion. 
you know, people name their children after lions and falcons and eagles, right? A mouse isn't even an orangutan, <laughs> you know, which is quite a stunning spe specimen as far as animals go. I mean, I could look at an orangutan all, all day. It was just so amazing looking. So, but I was, I was doing, and so I looked at some of the, the cartoon, the, the artists that they have, and I went to their Facebooks because I wanted to see what type of people these were. One of them had as his profession, defiler of children. And it just struck me as so strange that somebody who was doing cartoons for children would describe themselves as a defiler of children. A defiler is a corrupter. It's somebody that, that, that makes something dirty, that makes them unclean. So this, this is a major problem that we have, is that we're, we're not thinking about what our young people are growing up with. So on the one hand, we have the quwa al-ghadabiyya, and on the other hand, we have the quwa al-shahwaniyya. We have the, the, the dog soul, which is the anger. So half of our ummah is filled with rage and a desire for vengeance, and then the other half is, is filled with shahwat, with appetites concupiscent appetites, spending too much money, going uh, and, and wasting your money on, on empty things. In certain Muslim countries, they spend 15 times more on luxury items than the average Westerner. 15 times more a year on luxury items than the average Westerner. What is that? That's a sickness. And that's because they're trapped in their, their lower self. We haven't risen above these two souls because we have, according to Imam al-Ghazali, we have four faculties in our being, four faculties. We have the irascible soul, which is the dog soul, the shahwaniya soul, which is the pig soul, and then we have the faculty of justice, which is the balancing faculty, and then the, the sage soul or the rational soul. One of the American poets, he said, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it have, had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. He's talking about these two forces in the world of appetite and, 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 and anger. That the, the, the world, we're going to destroy ourselves out of our rage like these revolutionaries that want to tear everything down or out of our appetites where we're consuming until there's nothing left to be consumed. And this is a crisis because the sage soul, the, 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 the rational soul, and I'm talking about rational, I'm using this not in, 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 a, in a sense of, of, of formal logic, I'm talking about the true rational soul that sees essences, that sees first principles, that acknowledges reality, that recognizes beauty and harmony, that sees that behind this is something vast that we cannot co comprehend. We can only comprehend it in our incomprehensibility of it. And this is our Lord. This is real rationality. It's irrational to believe that this popped into existence out of nothing. The atheists are the irrational ones, not the believers. They are the truly irrational ones. And, and their crisis of knowledge should not be our crisis of knowledge because they no longer believe in anything. Their meaning is determined by each individual. This is their meaning. And this is why they can have wealth and fame and, they, and yet they take their lives. Even in our suffering, we don't take our lives because we believe in our suffering that there, there, is, there is something spiritual about suffering. We believe that suffering is redemptive. This is our belief. It's takfir al dhunu. It is, is, it is to remove our sins. And there will be people that have great suffering before they die. And our Prophet ﷺ had hasarat al mawt he, he experienced the pangs of death and actually said on his deathbed, the pangs of death are intense. So even the best of creation was not spared the pangs of death because this is the transition from this world to the next world. So this is important for us to keep in mind. In conclusion, I would say that if we don't seriously address 
the crises in our ummah, the current crises of knowledge in our ummah, and recognize that metaphysics has been lost in our ummah, the seeing the deeper causes of things, that we will be trapped in the economic causes, the political causes, and fail to recognize the deep spiritual causes that are at the root of, of the human condition. If we don't address the spiritual crises, which is, it's an intellectual crisis because the intellect, as I said, is a spiritual organ. It, it's, it's not a material organ, it's not a physical organ. When it, when it looks at intelligibles, it's called aql. When it looks at spiritual realities, it's called ruh or sir. But these are all synonyms for the same reality, which is a spiritual reality. If we don't address this deep-seated problem and recognize that the faculty of balance has been lost, that we need to restore this balance of our triune souls, that we have intellect and we have emotions and we have appetites. If these aren't working harmoniously in the proper order, then we either perish in fire or we perish in ice. Jazakumullah khairan wa